Oh, hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to the 2022 International Open Seminar on Semiotics, a tribute to John Dilly on the 50th anniversary of his passing. Whether you are watching us live now or watching the recording on YouTube, I would like to welcome you. This collaborative international open scientific initiative and celebration connects a network of dozens of personalities and organizations coming from various environments and with different profiles, all working in unison towards the advancements and propagation of semiotic studies. Today, the presentation is entitled Purs on Proper Names by Professor Dr. Francesco Bellucci. Thank you so much, Dr. Bellucci, for being here. And we are also glad to receive here Dr. Vincent Colapietro. Thank you so much, Dr. Colapietro. So I would like to start by introducing Dr. Bellucci, and then I will invite him to start his presentation. So Dr. Francesco Bellucci holds a PhD in semiotics from the Università di Siena, and he is currently associate professor at the Department of the Arts of the University of Bologna in Italy. He has worked at the Tallinn University of Technology in Estonia, and he was visiting researcher at the Perse Edition project. His research interests focus on Perse's logic, the theory and the history of semiotics, the philosophy of language and the philosophy of notation, and he is the author of Peirce's Speculative Grammar. I'm, I'm very interested in uh, watching Dr. Bellucci lecture, so please, Dr. Bellucci, you can start our presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, William. It's a pleasure to be part of this ongoing seminar in the memory of John Dealey. Can you see my slides already? No. So, so, can you see them now? No. Oh, so I have to share them before, yes, sorry. Okay. Yes, now we okay. can see. So the topic of this paper is Peirce's notion of proper names. Um, I was invited to talk about Peirce's notion of symbol. And, um, and as I will try to show, it is uh, important to uh, understand what uh, a symbol, what a symbol is in Peirce in order to understand what a proper name is, especially because uh, there are some, um, let's say, um, what I think are uh, uh, problems in the interpretation uh, of Peirce's notion of symbol that have consequences on how we understand his theory of proper names. So my topic, my focus is proper names, but I will have much to say uh, about symbols as well. Um, of course, there has been research. Research has been done on Peirce's theory of proper names. Uh, what I would like to do is to offer a developmental perspective on Peirce's theory of proper names. Uh, of course, I cannot give a, the full picture uh, of this development, but I will try to show that um, that it is the right approach. There are problems with what, uh, there are inc inconsistencies uh, in what uh, Peirce says about proper names. At some point he says that a proper name is an index. In another place he says that a proper name is a symbol that behaves or acts like an index. At the other places, he says that proper names are nearly poor indices. And then 
uh, at a very important point in, in, in the development of his semiotic ideas, he says that the proper name is an indexical rheumatic uh, legisign. This is not, uh, these oscillations, these inconsistencies, uh, taxonomic inconsistencies, uh, are not the effects of uh, confused thinkers, are the effects of a thinker, of a thinker whose, uh, whose ideas on science were in evolution. So we have to reconstruct the evolution of what he says about proper names in order to uh, correctly uh, understand him. There are other things that seems appear quite incompatible that uh, among, among the things that Peirce says about proper names is that the object, at, at some point he says that the object of an index is an individual. In another place he said that the, ob the object of an index is a general term. And this has consequences on, on what, uh, on how we uh, take uh, a proper, uh, on, on what we take a proper name to be. Um, I will focus on the left side of this um, page. So in, on the, I, I will focus on the taxonomic dimension. Uh, so the, the problem of the semiotic classification of proper names in this paper. And I argue that uh, only a developmental account as very often with Peirce, who was a thinker in continuous evolution, uh, only a developmental account of the theory uh, can solve, can, uh, can uh, solve these uh, inconsistencies, which are not inconsistencies, they appear to be inconsistencies only if we uh, take Peirce as a static thinker. Now, I, I wrote a paper on Peirce's theory of proper names in which I uh, identify, uh, this was published like a couple of years ago, one, one year ago, uh, the title is Peirce on Proper Names. And in that, in that paper, I argue that there are two dimensions, two aspects of the theory, of Peirce's theory of proper names. A taxonomical dimension uh, whose purpose is to answer the question, what kind of sign is a proper name? The other dimension is what we might call, following Peirce, the maturational dimension. And it has to do with uh, the normal, the ideal normal, uh, normal course of the interpretation of a proper name. Um, and it, it is my impression, or at least so I have argued in, in that paper, that up to 1903, and as we shall see, up to the syllabus of 1903, Peirce is interested in the taxonomical dimension. And it is after the uh, syllabus after 1903 that he becomes interested in the in the uh, maturational dimension. So, if I'm right, uh, mm, the developmental account uh, account uh, of Peirce's theory of proper names uh, mm, uh, makes us see that his interest uh, shifts from uh, the taxonomical dimension to the maturational dimension. Uh, the secondary literature, I think, has focused more on what I call the maturational dimension uh, than it has on the taxonomical dimension. And, and today I would like to uh, um, give you a picture of, of the taxonomical dimension. So I will leave the maturational dimension uh, in, back, in the background, uh, but I want to focus on the taxonomical dimension. The problem is what kind of sign is a proper name? I start with this quotation because it has uh, very important consequences on, on the way we understand the proper names. Uh, it is a quotation from the Harvard lectures of 1865. Uh, it per says that a term has a comprehension that is a has a connotation and as a denotation, 
And then, so a term, whatever term has these two dimensions, the connotation and the denotation, which is a classical uh, doctrine, the, the, the classical doctrine of the logical quantities of denotation and connotation. And then he uh, gives his own uh, classification of science, his basic classification of signs, symbols, indices, uh, icons, in terms of, that, of those two dimensions. He says that a symbol denotes by connoting. A representation which denotes without connoting is a mere sign, which is sign here in, the, in, this, in this context is the te technical term for what he will later call an index. Then he says that if a sign, if a representation, is a, if a term connotes without thereby denoting, it, it is a mere copy, which is the term that he uses in this context for what he will later call icon. So we can give a definition of symbols, icons, and indices in terms of what logical uh, quantities uh, they, they, they have. Symbols have both denotation and connotation. Indices only have denotation without connotation. Icons have connotation without denotation. In the same uh, series of lectures, Peirce gave cup, uh, two series of lectures, uh, one in 1865, one in 1866. Um, in, the, in the second uh, series of lectures, the lower lectures of 1866, he says, he gives the, 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 the following picture, the following uh, description of the three signs. There are copies, likenesses. This is the first kind of sign. Then there are indices, and he says about those uh, representation of signs. The second kind of representations are such as they are set up by a convention of man or a decree of God. Such are Tali's proper names. The peculiarity of the, etc. The peculiarity of this conventional science, a convention of man. The peculiarity of this conventional science is that they represent not character of their objects. And here now he has presented likenesses, icons, uh, indices, uh, and 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 he now uh, sums up the idea that. Uh, Likenesses denote nothing in particular. Conventional signs, that is indices in this context, connote nothing in particular. Icons connote without denoting, indices denote without connoting. The third and last kind of representation uh, are symbols or general representations. They connote uh, attributes and so connote them as to determine what they denote. That is, symbols denote by connoting. To this class belong all words and conceptions. So it, it, in this very uh, early um, exp exposition of the, of the theory, uh, proper names are indices. They denote without connoting. They are conventional, er, as indices are. So it's not proper names that are conventional signs. It's indices in general that are conventional. Proper names being indices are conventional signs. Now, and here the, the, the problem that I mentioned about symbols first emerge, emerges, there is a, a very, common widespread idea, according to which it is symbols, not indices, that are conventional signs. In that passage, Per says that words and conceptions are symbols and that they denote without connoting, but he says nothing about the conventionality of uh, the, the possible, the potential conventionality of the, of the symbol. So, what exactly is a symbol? I think that answering this question is 
crucial to understanding Perseus theory of proper names. There is a, a widespread in, uh, idea about symbols. Uh, here are some scholars that have explicitly or implicitly um, claimed uh, or supported this interpretation, which I call the conventionalist interpretation, according to which a symbol is a conventional sign. Uh, not only uh, symbols are conventional signs, but also conventional signs are symbols. So in, in some sense, the, we can say that a symbol is a sign genus whose specific difference is conventionality. But it is a difference that done, uh, does not extend beyond the genus because not only all symbols are conventional signs, uh, but also all conventional signs are symbols. Now, uh, of course, nobody has explicitly made uh, the claim that all symbols are conventional signs and all conventional signs are symbols. But I, 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 I like to, uh, mm, uh, let's say, um, construct this straw man, this uh, potential en uh, enemy, in order to uh, argue against this straw man and especially against the two commas or the two uh, dimensions of the uh, conventionalist interpretation. I think that, according to Peirce, not all symbols are conventional signs and not all conventional signs are symbols. I propose, I propose, I, I, I think that the, we would be on the right track if we uh, take uh, the definition of the symbol to be general sign rather than conventional sign. Of course, the conventionalist interpretation has exceptions that is many or some several scholars, Peirce scholars have noticed that it is a simplification, uh, it, that it is a bad simplification to claim that in Peirce symbols are conventional or that conventional signs are symbols. But I, 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 I'm arguing against this uh, widespread uh, idea um, uh, that has received criticism uh, before, before I, I, I uh, wrote about, about this. This is a passage from the new list, a very important paper by the early Peirce. He says, a distinction can be made can be made between concepts which are supposed to have no existence except so far as they actually that they, that they are actually present to the understanding and external symbols which still retain their character of symbols so long as they are only capable of being understood and as the rule of logic applied to this latter as much as to the former etc cetera, etc cetera, it follows that logic as for its sub subject genus all symbols and not merely concepts at that time first thought that logic the, the, the object of logic was symbols, not signs in general, but symbols. And in these passages implies, suggests that symbols are, that concepts are symbols, but there are other symbols, uh, uh, that there are symbols other than concepts, which should be included into the genus. And a slightly later passage, uh, makes a reference to, to the new list and says, I there, or says, I there, that is, I in the new list, also introduced the term symbol to include both concept and word. This is a very important, I think, a very important uh, uh, point that has to be made when talking about Peirce's notion of symbol. Uh, both concept and word. It was the same in 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 a, in, a, in, a, in the quotation uh, that I have. This, this quotation from the from the in this passage from the lower lecture. 
at the end he says symbol symbols connote attributes and so connote them as to determine what they denote to this class the class of symbols belong all words and conceptions and the idea um, that there are two varieties of symbols word-like symbols and concept like symbols is a constant idea in purse uh, you see in this in this uh, slide passages from 1865 1894 1903 1911 in which purse uh, describes uh, uh, defines or offers a description of symbols and he may in, in all of them but there are other which i have not uh, included in this slide he in all of these passages and in others he makes reference to two varieties of symbol those original and those that are acquired those that may have been deliberately instituted or and those that may have grown up in a natural way those based on natural dispositions or those based on conventions those based on dispositions or on factitious habits uh, of their interpreters there is a passage that was excluded i i think from the the, the, the final version of lower lecture number two of 1903 he gave he gave the second series of lower lectures in 1903 uh, and I think it's a very important passage. He says, a conventional sign has, since Aristotle and earlier, received the name of symbol. Of course, the implicit reference he has here is to the, the interpretazione, in which Aristotle does not say explicitly that a symbol is a conventional sign, but uh, goes very near to, to uh, implying such thing. Uh, and, and, and therefore the reference to Aristotle is, 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 is almost correct, uh, almost verbatim correct. Conventional sign has, since Aristotle and earlier, received the name of symbol. But beside conventional symbols, there are signs of the same nature, that is, signs that are symbols, except that instead of being based on express conventions, they depend on natural dispositions. Conventions, natural dispositions. They are natural symbols. All thought takes place by means of natural symbols and, on com and of conventional symbols that have become naturalized. This is the old idea that was already in the lower lectures of 1866, according to which symbols are of two main varieties, words and conceptions. Words, we might easily guess, are based on conventions. Concepts, conceptions, are not based on conventions. They are based on natural dispositions. They are natural symbols. There are conventional symbols, words. There are natural symbols, conceptions. If this is true, then it is false that all symbols are conventional signs. That is the first dimension of the conventionalist interpretation is, 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 is wrong. It is not true that all symbols are conventional signs. There are symbols that are not conventional. If this is true in turn, then we have to find an, another definition for the symbol because the, the definition uh, conventional sign by genus and the specific difference works, uh, does not work anymore. First, there is a, one thing that Peirce always or very often says about symbol, and this is that symbols are general signs. He says so in 18, 
1867 uh, in the new list. He says so in 1870, 1894, 1903, 1913. Uh, and there is a very um, simple explanation of why uh, symbols are general signs. General here means general as to the object. That is, uh, it is the object of the symbol which is, which is general. And a symbol is precisely that kind of sign whose object is general. Uh, the very simple explanation of the generality of the object is that symbols are signs that denote by connoting. And the mechanism of a denotation that is determined by the connotation is precisely the mechanism that determines generality in the object. That is to say that a sign denotes by connoting is the same uh, or amounts to saying that that the object it denotes is general. Um, so why was the index and therefore the proper name a conventional sign in uh, 1866 uh, in the passage that I am showing again. It is precisely because unlike symbols, indices denote without connoting. And anything which denotes without connoting, that, that is anything which denotes independently of the, of the connotation, cannot have a general object. It is purely conventional that the object is the object of the sign if the object is not determined by uh, the mechanism of connotation. Uh, dogs, are called dogs because they uh, satisfy all the characters connoted by the concept of dog, or the word dog. But my name is Francesco, uh, not because Francesco connotes any character which I happen to satisfy. It is a pure convention that, uh, that I am the referent of the name I was, I was given. This is more or less the idea behind um, behind um, um, Persu's uh, attribution of conventionality to the to the index uh, in uh, 1866, um, uh, and here are mm, and here is another. Mm, it's, it's a couple of passages uh, from, from that series of lectures in which uh, proper names are mentioned in which Pers is very, very clear that they are indices and they are conventional. Marks, this is another name for index, by which I mean such representations as denote without connoting. If the applicability of a, of a representation to a thing depends upon a convention, that is, does not depend on the connotation, but depends on the convention, which established precisely what it should denote, it would be a mark, it is an index. A proper name is an, in is an instance. So proper names are indices. They denote without connoting, they are conventional signs. Second passage, the second kind of truth is the denotation of a sign. Here again, so sign here has to be taken in the technical sense of index, according to a previous convention. A child's name, for example, by a convention made at baptism denotes that, per that person. Signs may be plural, but they cannot have genuine generality because each of the objects to which they refer must have been fixed upon by convention. Again, the point is that if, the point seems to be, if the denotation is not fixed 
by the connotation, then it must be fixed by some other means. Uh, symbols do not denote uh, objects by convention. Uh, perhaps we might say that convention, conventionality enters into symbol in the relation. So when, 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 when um, in, in the case of the conventional symbol, so the, the word, the general word, the, the common noun uh, is conventional in the sense that the conventionally, this is a, um, let's say a, uh, the beginning of an explanation. I don't have the full explanation. Um, the conventionality here is in the fact that the symbol uh, conventionally connotes rather than denote. It's the index that conventionally denote. Uh, the other dimension of the, of the conventionalist interpretation is that uh, according to the second uh, comma or dimension of the conventionalist interpretation, all conventional signs are symbol. We saw that uh, not all symbols are conventional, but it might still be the case that all conventional signs are symbols. Um, and in order to show that this is also not a correct representation of versus um, semiotics. Um, I have to show that uh, uh, not all conventional signs are symbols. That is, that some conventional signs are not symbols. Um, and in order to achieve this result, which of course is not the, 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 the main focus of this paper, but it's, it is a step towards the, the, the um, the, 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 the correct uh, representation of process theory proper names um, uh, is to uh, distinguish two notions of generality. So far, I have been concerned with the generality of the object of the sign. But there is another kind of generality that um, slowly emerges in Peirce's writings, especially from the 19th, uh, from the 1890s onwards. And that is the generality of the sign itself. So we see, uh, we can, uh, so there is this passage from 1894. Symbol, as we have seen, cannot indicate any particular thing. It denotes a kind of thing. It is a general sign in the sense that it has a general object. Not only that, but it is itself a kind and not a, thing, a single thing. So the symbol does, uh, the symbol has a general object, but it is also a general kind of thing. Again, in the logical tracts uh, of 1903, um, not only is man a general sign formaliter, that is formally, or in its signification, but it is also general materialiter in its mode of being as a sign. Man materialiter consists of three letters. So the word in itself is general in the sense that uh, uh, it's a general pattern of sounds or graphemes, but formaliter, in, that is in reference to the object represented of body and soul. And then again, and, and then finally there is uh, the syllabus, uh, in which Per says, the word the will usually occur from 15 to 25 times on a page. It is, in all these occurrences, one and the same word, the same legisign. Uh, and it is only with the syllabus of 1903, and uh, especially with with the second and last version of the syllabus of 1903, because of the syllabus there exist uh, at least two versions, the October version and the November version. And the, the, the October version is the manuscript titled Sundry Logical Conceptions. Uh, the November version is the manuscript uh, um, titled so let, let's say that the, the, the semiotics of the of the of the November version 
is contained in the manuscript, nomenclature and divisions of triadic relations so far as they are determined, which, which is a classic of semiotic because it was published in the collected papers. It is only with the last version of the syllabus, with the November version of the syllabus, that this idea of a general sign materialiter, that is of, of a sign that is general in itself, rather than or independent of the generality of its object, emerge, emerges and receive a, a proper um, nomenclature, a logisign. So we have to distinguish two notions of generality. There is the generality as to the sign itself, what in the logical tracts first calls generality or general materialiter. And, 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 and when a sign is general in this sense, from the syllabus onwards, it is called a logisign. Then there is the old, let's say, generality, that is the generality of the object, uh, what in the, log the logical tracks was called the, 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 uh, gen the generality formaliter uh, or general uh, formaliter. And this is the generality of the symbol. When a sign is general in this sense, it is a symbol. Now I have to uh, push things a little further by uh, introducing the idea of the classification. Uh, from his early writings on semiotics up to the October version of the syllabus, uh, the first version of the syllabus in 1903, Peirce divided science into icons indices and symbols, and symbols into terms, propositions, and argument. Um, and arguments. Th this is already a simplification because uh, already in the minute logic of 1902, there, are, uh, there is the idea of combining uh, the, the, the two levels of the, of, the, of the taxonomy, but I'm simplifying things a little bit, saying that it is only from November 1903, it is only with the November version of the syllabus that uh, uh, not only the trichotomies uh, of science icon, indices, symbol, terms, proposition, and arguments become combinable, let's say, but a third trichotomy, a third triplets of signs is added, is, um, uh, is included in the classification. So you have in the, November, in the November version of the syllabus, three uh, trichotomies, which do not constitute classes of science, but parameters by the combination of which the classes of science are obtained. Uh, the first trichotomy is into quality science, in sign, legis science, the second icons, indices and symbols, the third terms also called reams, propositions also called, also called distance or this is science and arguments. This very, very uh, famous, uh, classification. And by the combination of the three trichotomies, uh, 10 classes of signs are obtained by means of two rules of semiotic composability. This has been uh, studied in the literature. Um, of course, it is, it, it, uh, it is um, um, something that we know quite well. Uh, I call the two rules of semiotic composability R1 and R2. And when R2 is applied to the three trichotomy of the syllabus, we have that uh, a symbol can only be a legisign, but legisigns can be non-symbolic. And so the syllabus allows the, the existence of iconic and uh, indexical legisigns. 
uh, when applied at the level of the argument. So the first application is at the level of the symbol. When, when it is applied at the level of the argument, uh, it, it, it allows the existence uh, of iconic and indexical terms and of indexical propositions. Um, I, I do not um, spend much time on these because I presume it is um, um, sufficiently known to the, uh, to the first scholar uh, uh, in, so that I can um, focus on, 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 on my problem. Uh, uh, just to sum up a, a little bit, before 1903, terms, also called rimata, could only be symbols because here, before the November, the November version of the syllabus, Signs divided into icon, indices, and symbols, and symbols divided into terms, proposition, and arguments. So that the division, the trichotomy into terms, proposition, and arguments was a division of symbols. But if it becomes a division of all signs in general, then indexical, indexical terms or rimata become taxonomically possible. The proposition makes an assertion and anything that does not make an assertion is a term or rima. A proper name makes no assertion. It is a term or rima. But a proper name is not a symbol. It is an index. Before 1903, sorry, before November 1903, only symbols could be terms, rimata. After November 1903, also indices can be rimata. A proper name makes no assertion. Therefore, it is a term or rima. But proper name, we know since 1865, is an index, not a symbol. And therefore, it is an indexical rima. Mm -hmm. This combination of uh, semiotic parameters, indexicality and rem rematicity, mm -hmm. was impossible before the November syllabus. First, made some attempt towards explaining the non assertoric nature of, in, of some indices, proper names included, for example, in the Harvard lectures of 1903, the Harvard lectures were uh, delivered in the spring of 1903. The lower lectures, which I've mentioned uh, earlier, of, uh, were delivered in, in the fall of 1903. The syllabus was uh, a document that was prepared for the lower lectures. So in the Harvard lectures, those delivered in the spring of 1903, first had not yet elaborated the complex semiotic mechanism of the syllabus. He says here that a degenerate index is a representamen, it is a sign, which represents a single object because it is factually connected with it, but which conveys no information whatever. A degenerate index uh, has no information. Such, for example, are the letters attached to a geometrical or other diagram. A proper name is substantially the same thing. For although in this case, the connection of a sign with its object happens to be a purely mental association, yet the circumstance is of no import, yet that circumstance is of no importance in the functioning of the representative, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a relative demonstrative or personal pronoun, like proper names, comes very near to being a mere index if it be not accurately so. It is far more correct so to define it than to say that the pronoun is a word placed instead of a noun. It would be nearer right to say that the common noun, when subject nominative, is a word put in place of a pronoun. A degenerate index may be called the demonstrative index in, contra in contradistinction to an informational or genuine index. In other words, at that time, 
he wanted to express the difference between an index that makes an assertion and an index that makes no assertion. An index that conveys some information, an index that conveys no information. The first is the degenerate, at, this, at the end he says, a monstrative index. The index that makes an assertion is an informational or genuine index. Uh, but of course, unless he allows uh, terms, proposition, and arguments to be signs other than symbols, this distinction cannot be expressed in terms of the classification of sign. It, is a, it, is a, it remains a sub-classification. It is not a general classification of signs. So what in the Harvard lectures, spring 1903, he calls demonstrative and informational indices are precisely those that in the syllabus, so a few months later, he calls rheumatic and propositional indices. So we have achieved a second important um, um, item of the definition of an index, sorry, of a proper name, because a proper name is an index, but now it is also a rheumatic index in contrast to propositional indices. The last bit of the definition uh, of the proper name, of the definition of the proper name that um, is the um, culmination of Peirce's work uh, on this topic, the culmination being uh, the, the syllabus, the November version of the syllabus. Uh, the last bit, the last item of the definition uh, concerns the idea of, uh, that I have already introduced, of the generality materialiter. Peirce arrives slowly to this idea. So you see that in, 19, in 1894, he says, the use of every word depends somewhat upon the association of ideas so that no word is a pure index, but personal and demonstrative pronouns are nearly so, nearly pure indices. Uh, why not pure? Um, th th there is some, something that they have or something that they lack that, um, mm. that makes of them impure indices. Uh, then he says in uh, around 1898, every, every index is considered as an individual sign, but this individuality will not be, bear cross-examination, but betrays more or less generality because there is no pure index. Still, we may call a proper name or a demonstrative or personal pronoun an index. Why is not, why is, uh, isn't a proper name a pure index? Because it betrays more or less generality. Then there is the first version of the syllabus in which Persis introduced this very obscure notion of sub-index or hyposeme, which are signs which are rendered such principally by an actual connection with the object is a proper name, person, uh, personal demonstrative or relative pronoun. You see, proper names are always uh, associated with demonstrative pronouns, pronouns in general. Denotes what it, what it does owing to a real connection with its object, but none of this is an index since it is not an individual. Here, maybe for the first time Percy is explicit that the reason why it is not a pure index here, um, to, be, to be honest, it is not an index. None of this is an index since it is not an individual. Um, uh, here for the first time Percy says that it is because it is not an individual that is not an index. This has nothing to do with what the name denotes. This is the problem of the name itself. What kind of thing it is. And then there is the November version of the syllabus. The demonstrative pronoun that is a legisign, being a general type, but is not a symbol since it does not signify a general concept. First, does not say explicitly, explicitly so in the November version of the syllabus, but Proper name, like a demonstrative pronoun, a relative pronoun, is an indexical legisign. So it happens with the uh, 
uh, with the um, relation between uh, the icons in the symbols trichotomy and the and the legisign, sin sign, quali sign uh, trichotomy. Precisely what happens with the relation between the icon indices symbols trichotomy and the terms, proposition, and arguments trichotomy. Before 1903, general science materialiter, what in the syllabus, what in the November syllabus he calls legisigns, could only be symbols. That is why. Uh, is obscure. He says that the demonstrative and relative pronoun is not an index. None of this is an index since it is not an individual. With the syllabus, with the November version of the syllabus, he, he arrives at more uh, considered view. With the syllabus, indexical legisign become taxonomically possible. He says every conventional sign is a legisign, but a legisign can be non-conventional because now the uh, complete taxonomy allows the existence of symbolic legisigns, indexical legisigns, and both symbolic and indexical legisigns are conventional legisigns, but also of iconic legisigns. The portrait of Leibniz in the German <clears throat> post stamp is an iconic legisign. Is iconic because, because it represents Leibniz in its characters, but is a legisign because, because it is a type that occurs in replicas. It is a general kind of sense. So I'm like to underline that here you have a, a counter argument for the second dimension of the conventional interpretation because uh, of the notion of symbol, because you have legisigns which are conventional like symbolic and indexical legisigns, they might be conventional, but you have also non-conventional legisigns. It is not true that uh, conventional signs are, uh, are symbols. Uh, two uh, uh, final passages. I said that in, uh, in the syllabus, first never say explicitly, never says explicitly that a proper name is an indexical rheumatic legisign. But he says such a thing in two letters that uh, follow, uh, that are uh, slightly uh, later than the syllabus. One is a letter to uh, Led Franklin, uh, of 1904, first says, a proper name is not a symbol. The first time you hear it, it is an index. Afterwards, habit makes it a legisign, but it always remains an index. So a proper name, and here there is a um, allusion to, the, to what I've called the maturational dimension of the theory. Here, he, he, perhaps this passage is one of is the first or one of the first in which first starts thinking in terms of the ideal normal course of the interpretation of the proper names, so in terms of a maturational theory of proper names. Uh, but when it is uh, in its proper, uh, when, it, when, when it has uh, achieved maturity, a proper name is an indexical legislation behaves like an indexical legisign. It is not a symbol. It is a legisign that points to an individual object. The other passage that I wanted to consider is again a letter, again a letter of 1904, so again, slightly, slightly later than the syllabus. It's a letter to Lady Welby. It's a very um, uh, paradoxical letter because uh, in this letter, as many know, first, for the first time, offers a classification of signs that is based on six trichotomies rather than on three trichotomies, as, as it was in the syllabus. And from six trichotomies, uh, uh, much more classes. 
But in the postscriptum of the same letter in which, he, in which he for the first time proposes six basic trichotomies, he seems to, uh, to, to go back to the, to the, to the, to the syllabus, uh, so to, the three, uh, to, the, to the theory based on three trichotomies. He says, on the whole, then I should say uh, there were 10 principal classes of science. So he start begin, he, he, here he, begins thinking in terms of six trichotomies, but, but then he, when, when he has to conclude the letter, he says, okay, but let's, let's, let's remain with the, with the complete theory of the syllabus, of the syllabus with, the, with the stable uh, taxonomy of the syllabus. And here, unlike in the syllabus, the fifth class of science, the class of rheumatic indexical legiscience, is explicitly associated with proper names. Not only associated, proper name seems to have become the nomenclature, the proper nomenclature for this class of science. Like decent symbols are called propositions, like rheumatic uh, indexical scene signs are called vest uh, vestiges. I don't know what the English pronunciations, the pronunciation of this word is. Uh, vestigium uh, in Latin, and proper name is the proper name of this class of science. So we have no, um, uh, we should not hesitate in uh, identifying, uh, prop, uh, to, uh, should not hesitate in classifying proper names uh, with rheumatic indexical legislations according to the uh, semiotic framework of the syllabus, of the last version of the syllabus. A proper name is a rheumatic indexical legisign. Since it denotes without connoting, the proper name is an index. And this was already true in the uh, early um, lectures on uh, Peirce's earliest uh, exposition of his semiotics. Harvard and Lowell lectures of 1865-66. Since it is a general type that occurs in replicas, a proper name is a legisign. There are mm, some uh, allusions, there are some uh, symptoms of this idea in the 1890s, but this idea becomes uh, explicit in the November syllabus. And since it does not assert a proper name is a term or rima. As I said, there are, this idea is already in the minute logic of 1902, of which I have said nothing, but it, it, it becomes, it, it, it is embodied, fully embodied in the, in the November syllabus. And this is the explanation why in the November syllabus, a uh, proper name is a rheumatic indexical legislation. And, 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 and this I think is the culmination, is the last st step of uh, the, of Peirce's uh, theory of uh, proper names. After 1903, as I said at the beginning, uh, the, the focus of Peirce's interest um, no, of Peirce's reflections on proper names seems to shift towards a maturational interpretation of, 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 a, of a proper name uh, as, a, as, as a maturation. But up to 1903, up to 1903, uh, his interest is taxonomical and the result the, the final result of, the, of his taxonomic investigations into proper names is that uh, a proper name is a rheumatic indexical legislation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Bellucci, for this brilliant and very enlightening presentation. So <clears throat> I would like to introduce now Dr. Colapietro is the commentator of this presentation. So Dr. Vincent Colapietro is liberal arts research professor emeritus at the Pennsylvania State University. He is presently at the Center for the Humanities, University of Rhode Island. 
One of his main areas of research is pragmatism, with emphasis on birth. Though devoted to developing a semiotic perspective rooted in birth seminal work, Paula Pietro draws upon a number of other authors and perspectives, including Bakhtin, Jacobson, and Bourdieu, as well as such movements as phenomenology, hermeneutics, and deconstruction. Is the author of Purse's Approach to the Self, A Glossary of Semiotics, Faithful Shapes of Human Freedom, and Acción, Sociabilidad y Drama, Un Retrato Pragmatista del Animal Humano, as well as numerous essays. He has written on a wide range of topics, from music, especially jazz and cinema, to psychoanalysis and the construction from art and literature to ontology and phenomenology. He has served as president of the Charles Sanders Peirce Society, the Metaphysical Society of America, and the Semiotic Society of America. Thank you for being here, Dr. Colapietro. Welcome. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you for Francesco for that exquisite paper. So the first thing is, I, 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 in terms of chronology, at the very least, I feel like as though I'm one of the elders. And so I can be avuncular, I can act like an uncle, hopefully a gentle, uh, solicitous uncle. And I cannot recommend highly enough the paper that was appear that appeared in the Journal of the History of Philosophy by Francesco. This is a brilliant, wonderful paper. In the same breath, however, I would like to recommend another paper on the same topic. And that's a paper, and, and I, I have to um, confess to the possibility of bias because he was a doctoral student of mine. But I, I want to call to your attention, if you do not know this paper, one by David Agler that appeared in the Transactions of the Purse Society, Purse's Direct Non-Reductive Contextual Theory of Names. And it's a complementary paper to the one that Francesco published in the Journal of the History of Philosophy David takes a developmental approach, but not principally such an approach. Um, I, might make, I might mention very quickly two other pieces. One, one by um, Giovanni Maddalena that is really suggestive. Purse, names and nicknames. Because, because one of the things I wanna to do today is suggest that the scope of Peirce's concern, and this is not a criticism, but the scope of Peirce's concern is much wider than if we try to fit him in to the focal disputes within contemporary analytic philosophy of language. Those disputes are important. Peirce's contribution to those controversies are important, but there's a bigger, deeper story to tell. And we ought never to lose sight of the depth and the expanse of Peirce's contribution. Not that Francesco would, would but I just wanna bring that home. The, the other thing, and this is gonna seem far afield, but it's not, I don't think, is the presidential address by Alistair McIntyre to the, the American Philosophical Association in which he talks, and I will quote at some length McIntyre later, uh, in which he uh, addresses the issue of names in an extremely suggestive manner we ought to take into account. The, 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 the address is entitled Relativism, Power, and Philosophy. Okay, so, um, allow me at the outset then to step back from Francesco's paper, from his characteristically 
erudite, probing, detailed, nuanced, and above all, illuminating paper. But allow me to step back and to reflect on the task or set of tasks confronting PERS scholars today. What I have to say in this regard is applicable to other historical figures, Ponceau, Plato, Desassur, John Dealey. Allow me a personal note here. Uh, John Dealey was a friend in, in commemorating his, his death uh, is important and and uh, and so I'm honored and humbled by the by this occasion. Uh, but as it was as noted in the very title of this, uh, and, and and this doesn't make the tragedy any less tragic. It just means that we've had more time to deal with it. Uh, it was five years ago, less than two weeks ago. Richard Bernstein died significantly, accidentally, but significantly on July 4th. No philosopher has, who has done more to bring for, including his friend Richard Rorty, has done more to bring to the fore the importance, the relevance of American philosophy than Richard, who was a dear friend and an informal mentor. So on this occasion, it's both, uh, for me at least, in memory of Richard and John. Okay, sorry for that in, in personal interjection. So Peirce was a rigorously, intensely, self-conscious uh, methodologist. And this is, I'm picking up on something uh, in, in, in Francesco's paper implicitly. Um, and so the deliberate cultivation of methodological self-consciousness and the use of that consciousness as an aid in attacking a problem or a set of problems was at the very center of Peirce's project. So what, what Fran Francesco has done, of course, is properly, properly um, situated him, um, not, I'm sorry, he has properly stressed the hermeneutic necessity for a developmental approach. And this seems exactly right. He, he's, in a, he's in a long lineage and he knows it. Um, Donna Orange's book on God, which, which was a dissertation under Vincent Potter at Fordham, Peirce's concept of God, a developmental approach. Uh, Joseph Esposito's book on evolutionary metaphysics, development of Peirce's theory of categories. Um, Tulio Viola's much more recent book, Person and the Uses of History. The, the, I hope this is not inappropriate. The, I mean, the, 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 the the most important chapter in my book on the on person's approach to self, I, I presume is the fourth chapter in which I give a developmental account of person's approach to the self. So, so yes, yes, yes. Amen, brother. Um, and, 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 and of course, this, this has been the rationale for the, the, the first edition project for the new edition and the, 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 epi the, the, the epigram for my paper, which I, I, I misplaced, and I'll, but I'll interject here, is actually from uh, a, an essay published by Isabel Stearns in 1952 in the Studies, the first series, where she says, Peirce's philosophy is above all a philosophy of the incomplete of growth and of development. And, and, and it's precisely the essential, invincible incompleteness of Peirce's philosophy, which in part I want to stress. But, 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 but uh, another thinker, another scholar of Peirce, Beverly Kent, 
took as the epigram for her book on the classification of sciences, one of the most important quotations from Peirce, and Max Fish never tired of citing this passage. It's a somewhat grammatically complex. I'll try to read it such, it's, such that it's accessible. As to Plato, unless we are content to treat the only complete collections of the works of any Greek philosopher that we possess as a mere repository of gems of thought, as most readers are content to do, but rather let us wish to view them as they are so superlatively worthy of being viewed as the record of the entire development of a great thinker. Then, and if we do that, then everything depends upon the chronology of the dialogues. And as you know, Peirce was painstakingly involved in trying to get the chronology of Plato's dialogues just right, as we ought to be, and Francesco has done Herculean labor here, and others, of course, but, but, but uh, as we ought to be concerned with getting the chronology of Peirce's manuscripts just right. Dr. Colapietti, you're yep, okay. sorry. No, no, knowing, knowing full well that history is more than chronology, but without chronology, history is a fabrication, is speculation. Okay. So, for, let me just continue then uh, and suggest that, and here I quote. Manley Thompson and, and, and Francesco and I have a disagreement because I, I think that uh, uh, Thompson does not offer a, a static account. It's not a fully formally explicitly developmental account, but the account of Peirce's pragmatic philosophy Manley Thompson provides us with is deeply informed about the historicity of Peirce's thought. And, and this becomes evident in the preface to that book, where he says, perhaps, Thompson says, writes, perhaps no philosopher engaged in more self-commentary, engaged more in the practice of ex appending explanatory and critical notes to his writings, even after many years, after uh, many years they were written, and also even giving detailed autobiographical information of how he came to these positions. No philosopher has engaged in this sort of activity more than Peirce. As a radical experimentalist, Peirce was a contrite fallibilist who confessed time and again that his earlier efforts produced inadequate results. And that's precisely what Francesco has so brilliantly brought to the fore. How Peirce is engaged continually, not continuously, continually in a process of self-revision rooted in self-critique. So what I suggest then is that the task before us today is threefold. As first scholars, we ought in the first instance to engage in the really massive, overwhelming undertaking of what might be called archival interpretive work. And, as, and all I mean by that is precisely with those, right? We, we go to the archives, we, 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 we we collate the, the relevant text and we try to interpret them uh, as fairly, fully, and deeply as we possibly can.
I'm gonna I'm gonna run over this uh, quickly. Second task, there is what I call the creative critical undertaking. This might also be 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 identified as the reconstructive task, the task of painstakingly reconstructing Peirce's position as the strongest possible argument, more often than not, almost always, in light of the polemical field of contemporary thought. Now you'll notice that Francesco is an exemplar of both of these. He's done his homework as an archival interpretive scholar. He has also done more than his homework in terms of the reconstruction of Peirce's considered opinion in light of the series of revisions leading up to it. That is to say, he's engaged in the critical, constructive, creative task of bringing, making Peirce available to us on his own terms, but largely answerable. It, it, it didn't come out in this presentation. It comes out in the, in the article, Peirce on, on Proper Names, much more where the, the comparisons and the contrast with Kri Kripke and with, with, with Devitt and with, with a whole bunch of other analytic, predominantly analytic philosophers of mind uh, it, it, it is guiding, shaping, directing, and to some measure, directing the course of the conversation. So the work of critique is always, to some extent, an exercise of imagination. Hence, an instance of creativity, such as uh, the creativity witness, witnessing here, is driven by a sense of the inadequacies, inadequacies, flaws, apparent contradictions, limitations of some inheritance, say, Peirce's writings. So what we have here, it seems to me, and it, it, it's, a, and, and I'm not, there's no hierarchy here. I'm not saying one's better, one task is more important or more lofty or more noble than the other. But, but what we have here is Peirce being appealed to as primarily a resource for addressing contemporary philosophical questions as those questions have taken shape in the actual history of some relatively determinant philosophical tradition. And if we're talking about the if we're talking about the philosophy of language, we're talking about one or another of the analytic traditions of philosophy. And that's that's a tremendously important engagement. Tremendously important. But we're but we're turning to Peirce as a resource to answer our questions or the questions of the day. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, there's much that's right with that. Third and finally, there is what might be called the most robust, robustly philosophical task. And this should be undertaken in a truly and unapologetically Persian spirit. This involves above all not turning to Perse primarily as a resource for answering our questions, but as one, uh, as, as one who was especially purse, as one who was especially gifted at posing questions. I, I, I suppose he was wrong when during a series of lectures, he, um, between one lecture and the other, uh, Herbert Spencer had died. And Peirce said, perhaps the greatest or the most important question we can ask of a philosopher 
what did he prove? I don't. I think he was wrong on this. What pro, what philosopher has proved to the satisfaction of any other philosopher a truth? What 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 what, what I think philosophers do is ask questions that reconfigure the terrain of inquiry more than they prove truths. So not, so, so Peirce was especially gifted at posing questions of an extremely simple yet profound, truly profound character. Insofar as we take the forms of our debates to be given, the terms in which they are most constructed, though they are most effectively carried out to be already in place, we miss most of his genius and most of the power of his thought. It's very telling. It's very telling that Peirce doesn't really fit in any of the categories. He exhibits uh, on the question of names, for example. It, there's, there are affinities to Kripke and there are dissimilarities, right? There, there, there are even affinities to the, the, the Russell Mill tradition. Uh, so if we're going to persist in fitting Peirce into the conventional boxes, we're going to be uh, guilty of uh, constru uh, constructing Procrustean beds. So rather than fitting him into our context, we ought to allow the power of his thought to transform our context of reflection and inquiry. We ought to allow him to recontextualize us and our endeavors. He labored courageously, largely in isolation from others, and especially in his last years, and produced a categorically expansive framework of sweeping scope, but also one possessing invaluable resources for the most intricate, minute analyses. These are then three irreducibly different tasks but in practice, they are frequently conjoined, and indeed, they tend to be connected in complex, subtle ways. As a community of inquirers and interpreters, we are in historical actuality never anything more than a motley group of companionable antagonists. So let us not denigrate those whose talents and interests incline them to, to vote themselves to tasks other than the ones in which we find our most sustaining, fulfilling work. So I want to quickly then, because I've gone on too long, um, quote, I'm gonna, I'll paraphrase it because I, because it'd be, it's, it's just too long. So what, what McIntyre does in this particular essay, the APA presidential address, is he says that uh, names never identify persons and places simply as such. They always do so for specific historical, linguistic and cultural communities. And he uses a really telling example. He uses, he says, the Irish expression, both the ancient Irish and the contemporary uh, expression. Uh, I'm, I'm, I will mispronounce this, and I, I, I apologize. Dork, dork, uh, conceal, uh, is not the same name for the place as Londonderry. In some sense, in some sense, they might be taken to be 
name, the same different names for the same place. And that for certain purposes, we might be able to abstract from the histories of those, those words and use those words as names to find our way or to locate ourselves. But in truth, each one of those names bears a complex contested history. And if we do not know the complexity and the contestedness of the histories of the names we so casually use, we don't know, we cannot hear in their deeper resonances and their more complicating nuances what those names mean for any number of one any number of us so one way to say it is that as crucial as the grammar of names is the rhetoric perhaps the pragmatics of naming is no less important and from for some of us no less interesting this is not in the least to disparage those who focus on the grammar of names and try to, how can I uniquely identify a unique singularity? That's an extremely important question. It's the question to which Francesco and others have devoted considerable and in, in more in, in an ingenious in the best sense attention. But Names, I would submit, fulfill a variety of functions, perhaps all of them parasitic on this most basic grammatical function of uniquely identifying a unique singularity. But there is, in fact, a plurality of functions which names serve. So, Hearst, the formalist, uh, never to be denied or disparaged. Hearst, the taxonomist, whom I incorporate within his, for lack of a better word, formalism. But the taxonomy is at bottom a taxonomy of functions. A name is that which enables me to uniquely pick out a unique singularity. What is it about a sign that enables me to do that? So, 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 so it seems that, and again, and again it's not, uh, there's not an implicit criticism. I take there to be a fundamental complementarity to what I'm proposing. But fun so the emphasis falls differently, though, right? Plurality of functions, functions, historicity. When we're talking about proper names, the names of unique, singular persons and places, let's also turn to Peirce's writings, his theory of science, and also his reflections on categories as a resource for addressing aspects of names that tend not to be focal within the analytic philosophy of language. That philosophy of language has done as much as anything to illuminate the semiotic and distinctively linguistic character of language. But language is more than the linguists appear to recognize, and even the philosophers of language. And perhaps uh, signs are more than even semioticians uh, appear on occasion to appreciate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Colapietro, for this brilliant commentary. Uh, Dr. Bellucci, do you have any? Other responses or other commentaries? 
very briefly, I want first of all to thank uh, Vincent for for this comments, uh, which I am honored to have to receive uh, for the for the paper. Of course, thanks for the suggestions uh, of titles that I did not know and and for comments that I consider very seriously. Uh, and as always, Vincent would be or, or perhaps was the best reviewer possible for for a paper on uh, on this topic. Um, I, I especially uh, appreciate uh, the methodological uh, uh, observations that Vincent has made. Uh, I, I, I think I agree um, uh, very much. Um, I I agree. I also agree with the with the, di the distinction that that Vincent has has made between uh, three mm, tasks, um, three three uh, philosophical and uh, distinct but related enterprises. Uh, I think Vincent has been has been too generous mm, to me in saying that I I do both the first and the second. So both the interpretative or exegetical work and the creative critical uh, work. Uh, I, I, I think I, I modestly try to, to do the first, or, or, or perhaps I, I think I'm only doing, doing the first. Uh, mm, oh, the, 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 second, the second kind of philosophical task that Vincent has um, uh, described, mm, it's it's a very it's a very difficult thing to do and and um, for example in, in in the paper or in, in other things that I, I have read or or, or or written on Peirce I I, I see that uh, Peirce is put into dialogue with for example and, and this is the case of Peirce's theory of, prop, of proper names with uh, analytical philosophers of language um, and. I, I do think that Peirce have very interesting things to say that solve some of the problems or some of the classical problems of uh, analytical philosophy of language. Uh, but there is a still another um, aspect of it in that we may use uh, um, the categories or the, the distinction, the terminology of analytical philosophers of language. Uh, I, I, I make a couple of examples. Um, the distinction between sense and reference, or the distinction between the elocutionary, the perlocutionary, locutionary demands of, of a speech act, in order to understand Peirce. Not, not to say that Peirce, not in order to say that uh, his solutions were uh, better than Austin's solutions or Frege's solutions, even though I think that some of those theories and, and concepts were even better suited for those problems. But just in order to clarify things and say, okay, I think uh, we, we might um, understand Peirce as saying um, something similar to, uh, as, as, as uh, assuming a distinction similar to that between sense of reference or to, to locutionary, elocutionary, perlocutionary dimensions of this picture. This is a, Another aspect of the of the of what Vincent has called the, the um, creative and critical undertaking, um, and 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 then perhaps it is it is in this sense that that I can be ascribed to the second task, uh, or, or at least that, that Vincent has generously uh, ascribed me to that to that component. Uh, I I perhaps I have to think. A bit more about what Vincent has uh, said about um, the plurality of functions of proper names. Um, the first thing that um, comes to my mind is that, uh, uh, of course, allowance is made in Peirce's theory for the signification of proper names. So the fact that he is very clear that a proper name is an index and as an index denotes without connoting uh, um, leaves some room 
leaves space for the idea that a proper name still have or may have or may acquire in the course of his interpretation a signification. Uh, Persis is clear at some point that proper names do have a signification, even though the signification uh, d- uh, does not serve the, 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 the normal um, purpose of signification. So let's say that the normal purpose of signification is to fix the referent, to fix the denotation. In the case of proper name, proper name have, may retain or may acquire signification, which has to do with the history of the employment and the emergence and the disappearance and so on. And still uh, that signification does not what signification usually does, that it does not serve to fix the denotation. Perhaps this is, uh, and this of course brings into question the maturational dimension, not just the taxonomic dimension. I think this, this is something that Per says that, that goes in the direction of what uh, Vincent was, uh, might go in the direction of, of the idea that proper names have a plurality of functions and that uh, complete person theory of proper names must take all those functions into account. Uh, many, many thanks again, Vincent, for as, as usual, very, very intelligent comments. Might I just, I, I, I might interject just a very uh, short comment because I, that, this is, I think this is, an, uh, so Fran, Francesco, you, 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 you are not fair to yourself. You do, you really do uh, reconstruct Peirce's argument, but there's this passage from R283. You quote it, Madalena, Giovanni Madalena quotes it, David Agler quotes it, and it's an extremely important passage from my perspective. I think from yours, I know from Giovanni's, and uh, David thinks it's important, but he, he and I go back and forth. And, and, and um, it's hard to know, but, but, but the expression I wanna focus upon is the continuity of the history of its object. And it's, he's connecting this with names and in particular with marks, which you, you glossed Francesco as uh, indices. So the continuity of the history of an object so there, there's a sense in which ontologically the bearer of a name is a historic, uh, a unique historical continuum. Now it might be conceivable to name an instant, if of course in a person universe, strictly speaking, this is not cosmologically possible, but, 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 but it might be possible to name uh, an altogether instantaneous event, an event without any degree of continuity. Uh, now, a person's not going to grant that cosmologically or ontologically, but it seems to me that there's something really important in that expression, the continuity of a history of an object. And I would add, without which, names would never have any, could not pick out uniquely unique continua but i so i want to throw that out because i'm confused by that i want to use that passage in a certain way the passage doesn't readily lend itself to my use i'd love to hear what anybody else has to say about that or anything else thank you okay uh I think I will will close the broadcasting on YouTube now, and we will open the floor to the audience to have a, a discussion with everybody here. So thank you, thank you so much. It was a brilliant session. We will close the broadcasting on YouTube, but the floor is open to the audience present here, or to Dr. Belucci.